Welcome to the last in our series of engineered wood products training webinars. Today's topic is glue lamb beam and header applications. And good morning, everybody. As Frank mentioned, I'll be presenting today on the sixth module of the engineered wood products series. Um, today's presentation will be on glue lamb, introduction to glue lamb, as Frank mentioned. All right, let's get started. So as Frank mentioned also today that uh, this is an AIA approved, so um, we're going to quickly uh, discuss what we're going to be covering today and what the objectives, learning objectives will be for this presentation. We're going to talk about uh, basic glue lamb characteristics, balanced and unbalanced beams, and when to specify appearance classifications, selecting and sizing stock beams, reading the grade stamp, we'll talk a little bit about checking, and recommended connections, a little bit on notching and drilling practices, and treated glue lamb and some of the typical applications. And including factory and field applied stains and finishes. So let's talk a little bit about the features and benefits of glue lamb. One of the great things about glue lamb is that we can do a lot in the manufacturing of this product. So it can fit pretty much any floor framing system, whether it be lumber or eye joist or any other type of uh, framing material. Size to fit any need. That's a good benefit to have for uh, both residential and commercial needs. Treated beams in stock. Um, another be uh, beautiful thing about the uh, uh, glue lamp beams is that unlike the dimension, or, or the, not dimension, but the large timber products, uh, there's limited or no warping and twisting. Beams don't need to be assembled. They're already the size as designed when delivered. There's a no zero or straight beams that are in stock. No furring. We've got beams that are uh, match both the dimension 2x4 and 2x6 wall systems. So what is a glue lamb anyway? Glue lamb stands for glued laminated timber. They're used in uh, columns, beams, trusses, and other framing components. Both commercial and residential construction. They're manufactured in laminations that are typically uh, inch and three eighths or inch and a half thick. There are other thicknesses available depending on custom needs, but for purposes of today's presentation, generally we're dealing with just that uh, uh, nominal uh, inch and a half thick lamination. Bonded with exterior adhesives, and they're CARB and uh, JAZZ compatible. CARB, California Air Resources Board, and uh, Japanese, the Japanese standard, uh, which means that they have uh, also meet or exceed what the emissions requirements are for, for formaldehyde. That's a hot topic nowadays and uh, in, in the construction industry. And wood laminated beams meet or exceed and sometimes are even exempt from um, from those requirements. All right. So a glue lamb, as I mentioned already, is comprised of a just a bunch of two by members uh, that are laminated in a parallel direction to each other with an adhesive, an exterior adhesive. Um, we can laminate or we can uh, manufacture glue lamb in pretty much any size that we want. Uh, they're limited by either the facility of the manufacturing facility or many times transportation uh, limitations. The, the beams uh, individually, the two buys are 
uh, finger jointed so that we can get the lengths that we need if we need uh, extremely long lengths and then those pieces are then uh, laminated to each other. And this is a kind of a close-up shot of that. You can see up here in the uh, top right area we've got a finger joint, what it might look like on the uh, edge of the beam, what that finger joint might look like. You can see that uh, some of the glue lines are fairly visible. Some of the glue lines may not be that visible. We've got a number of characteristics, <coughs> excuse me, growth characteristics uh, that occur in the, the manufacturing of the beam. The nice thing about glue lamb is it's a very strong product and we're able to do that because we can we can disperse these characteristics in various locations throughout the beam. It becomes very consistent and reliable in design and uh, as I said we can manufacture high, uh, high strength beams. All these beams uh, have to meet the product standard ANSI A190.1. We're in the 2012 version right now. That's a requirement uh, by uh, the model codes. And so uh, you'll notice on all the stamps, we'll get to that later, that the manufacturing uh, has to um, be referenced by and adhere to the requirements within the standard. This covers things like lumber material, requirements, laminating and adhesive requirements, things like that, that deal with the qualification and quality assurance requirements for the product. And uh, it, it requires that the manufacturing process is observed and monitored by third-party inspection. Once manufactured, Glue lamb are, are typically wrapped in either single beam fashion or sometimes in a uh, uh, load wrapped condition. Depends on the uh, end need of the of the uh, user of the product. The manufacturer can can um, work uh, either direction. They can help out in in uh, providing either single or or bulk wrapping, if you will. So iJoyce compatible depths, that's kind of a relatively uh, new change in the, in the uh, glue lamb industry. Glue lamb's kind of been the, the engineered wood product, the original engineered wood product, been around for, for quite some time. But a lot of new innovations in glue lamb over the past few years to keep up with uh, market and industry changes. This happens to be one of those, which is the iJoyce compatible depths. <clears throat> now that we use more engineered wood, iJoyce products, uh, we need to make sure that the glue lamb fits the, the dimensions of those iJoyce so that uh, finished products either on the, the top surface of the floor and or the drywall that might be adhered or uh, fastened to the bottom of the, of the uh, joist, that we have a good even plane between the transition of those two products. Glue lamb manufacturing is uh, manufactured at very tight tolerances, like in the 16th inch range. So there's usually not too much to worry about there as far as uh, the compatibility between those products. Preservative treatments. Uh, we're seeing a lot more glue lamb used in areas like oh, decks, columns that are exterior, exterior decks and columns, maybe retaining walls. Um, retaining walls that might be near salt water or crawl spaces, um, even high moisture conditions like indoor pools uh, where we have a lot of moisture in the air which can uh, cause decay to untreated wood. All those are great applications for uh, preservative treated glue lamb. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's pretty uh, cost competitive when we do treat and it still in many times leaves us a nice beautiful beam if we if we do need to have an exposed application. Another new thing on the glue lamb or high strength glue lamb. The real workhorse in this industry has been the if you if you've used glue lamb in the past have been the 24F 1.8 beam. It's been around a long time. It's satisfied 
probably 80, 90 percent of the needs and still does. But uh, once in a while, we have a call out or a need for higher strength, uh, especially when some of the new engineered wood products came into the market. The glue lamb industry again saw the need to to uh, advance uh, their technology and come up with new products that would be competitive. So you either have a uh, uh, southern yellow pine beam that, that can be as high as a 30F 2.1E, or in this case, the picture you see here, it may be difficult to see on the screen, I'm not sure, but on both the top and bottom laminations, you see there's an LVL. This is called a hybrid glue lamb, high strength glue lamb. Both of those are uh, readily available and, uh, and many times in stock. We all know that uh, houses have become more and more elaborate and complex in design. We've got uh, maybe tall walls and foyers or the great rooms where we want to have large window areas and a lot of lighting. Those areas can uh, be more difficult in design as far as not just the, the gravity loads, um, but also the wind loads on such a large area. Blue Lamb's a great product to satisfy the designs to resist those wind loads um, with these long balloon frame uh, uh, columns. So a little bit on the anatomy here. Uh, this is this is a, a diagram of a simply supported beam, and we essentially have two stresses that we think about in the design and use of a glue lamp. Uh, the first one, as you see here, is the shear force. The shear force uh, on this simply supported beam is uh, pretty much zero in the middle, and it gets larger and larger as we get out to the bearing points of the beam. And conversely, the bending moment um, on, on the uh, beam, the loads accumulate as we get farther and farther to the center point of the beam, so the highest loads are in the center point of the beam, the highest uh, moment in the center point of the beam. And again, this is simply supported, uniformly loaded beam. Um, we also uh, have to take into consideration the deflection, uh, the stiffness of the beam. So just as in the bending moment, deflection is greatest in the midpoint of the beam. Essentially, there's uh, two types of beams uh, in, in, the, um, in the wood industry and in the glue lamb industry. They have a uh, balanced and unbalanced beam that we can choose from. Um, regardless of whether we're dealing with steel, concrete, wood, doesn't matter. When we um, have a loaded beam, we need to engineer that beam to be able to handle a, a given load. So in the um, glue lamb industry, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's either an unbalanced beam or a balanced beam. Essentially what that means is that uh, the manufacturing process allows the producer to select and put uh, different quality or grades, if you will, uh, strength grades of laminations in the areas of the beam that matter for the use of that product. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but an unbalanced beam is made to be used in, ten, in tension only. We've got a tension side here, as you can see, and we have a compression side, but up on the compression side we have uh, different quality uh, um, strength laminations that are used. And on the balanced beam, as, it, as the name infers, we've got um, a symmetrical beam where it can be used uh, in either direction when loaded. So one of the benefits, as I said, with the manufacturing process of glue lamb is that the manufacturers could take advantage of the balanced and unbalanced and 
in certain applications, one works better than the other. The unbalanced is made to use in a simple span. It's got an orientation to the beam with the top, whereas the unbalanced can be used in multi-spans or cantilever situations. We don't have an orientation to the top because it's designed and expected to be loaded in both directions, as in a multi-span or a cantilevered uh, application. And because of the manufacturing process and being able to select different quality uh, strength mem uh, laminations within the member, they can uh, be as efficient with the cost of that product. And uh, you can use the appropriate product for the appropriate uh, application without adding significant costs to the use of the product. So here's kind of a colored version or a little bit more detail of what we're talking about. So unbalanced, as you can see here, uh, we've got laminations on the tension side that are the highest quality, highest strength tension lands. Up here on the compression side, we have slightly less, but still high, but still in the higher strength category as far as uh, strength uh, categories are concerned with laminations of the beam. And the closer we get into the middle or the center point, it becomes um, lower grade inner lambs because we don't need that strength in the inner portion because of the design or, or uh, intended orientation and use of the beam. And because it's unbalanced, um, we mark the top of the beam with top. So if you happen to walk into a job site and you look up and see the framing members above your head and you see the word top, that means to turn over, please. OK, not really. So actually, what that does mean is that the beam was put in in the wrong orientation. It was uh, flipped over to where it was uh, designed for. So we reduced the strength characteristics of or design parameters of that beam. Does it necessarily mean we have to tear it out and start over? No, not necessarily. We'd go back to the engineer record first, figure out what the design loads were. There are tables. Uh, available that, that tell us what the reduction factor is if we have this beam uh, flipped upside down in the wrong application, or if we saw it used in multi-span, same thing, or a cantilever. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to tear it out, but uh, we definitely need to check it and have it rechecked by the engineer record to make sure that, uh, that we can still use or leave the beam in, pl in place. So the balance, as I mentioned before, is as it sounds. It's balanced to be used or loaded in both directions, top or bottom. You can see now we've got the highest strength product on both sides of the beam, top and bottom. And again, we've got the lower strength filling the mill where it's uh, less critical. And we don't need uh, as high as strength, high as quality, which also means higher price. So Again, the beauty of both the, the unbalanced and balanced is we can use the material as efficient as we can in the manufacturing process so that they can provide a cost-effective product to the end user. So what about columns? Columns are a little bit different. Um, we intend the columns to be loaded in all axes, so the layups are a little bit different. They'll use a certain layup for a certain application, but as you see here, it's the same material throughout because as you see on this side over here, we're loaded in all axes. What about checking? If you've ever used glue lamb in the past, I'm sure that you've already discussed this with somebody, seasonal checks in a glue lamb. There are those out there to this day that still believe because glue lamb is manufactured with um, smaller uh, dimension size two by laminates that for some reason we'll never see checking again in the wood. The beauty of the glue lamb is that 
relative to a um, large timber, the checking you see in a glue lamb can be very, very minor. It's possible you don't see any checking. But the expectation would be that over time, depending on the conditions where it's used um, and the environmental conditions exposed to, that uh, we might see some checking. So what is that? Basically what happens is wood reacts to moisture by uh, either shrinking or swelling depending on whether the water is moving in or the moisture is moving in or out of that piece of wood. So the degree of difference between the amount of moisture moving from the core to the outer, from the core here to the outer area of that two by member, the, the more that that variation changes between the core and the outer area, is more susceptible then to checking. So if that stress gets great enough, then we'll see some degree of checking on the beam. So what kind of checking would we be concerned with? Well, the first one we already talked about or we looked at, that was called an end check that we just looked at. Essentially those end checks uh, can be as far as half. So as long as the distance is less than half of the member, then uh, we're okay. The check might look ugly. It could get um, wide if it's exposed to real severe condition changes between moisture and heat. But um, for structural purposes, we're okay. The next type of check that we'll talk about or look at is this side check here. So as you see here, we've got a fairly long check. You can see uh, closely here uh, a number of areas of fiber pole inside of that check, so the depth of that check is probably pretty limited. The rule says that as long as the depth of that check is no more than one-third of the width of that member and that it's no more than one-third of the length of this beam, we're okay. So again, they can look pretty severe and be pretty large, but as far as structure is concerned, uh, we're fine at one-third, one-third. This happens to be a bottom check here. So we're looking up at the bottom side of that beam, and as long as those checks are parallel to the length of that beam, there are no limitations in size. As long as they're parallel, we're okay. And I don't expect you to remember all of this stuff either today. So we've got a guide. APA has put together a technical note. You can see down here on the bottom. Technical uh, note called Evaluation of Check Sizes and Glued Laminated Timber Beams, Form F475. Essentially, what this guide does is it establishes what sizes of checks are okay without an engineering analysis. So we kind of walk through these yes-no uh, questions on where it's located and the size that it is, and it'll tell us whether or not we need to, to uh, get an engineer involved to look at the uh, reduction in uh, strength if there is an issue. But most of the time uh, when we are called out to go to job sites and look at these checks, um, they typically fall within what the allowable ranges are, so usually aren't a concern. Uh, if you happen to see one, make sure that uh, you really get up there and look closely at that check, because a lot of times they migrate out and reveal themselves close to a glue line. So there's many times confusion that it's a glue line or a delamination between the two laminations. But when you uh, closely observe, usually you'll see that there's some fiber between uh, that glue line, between the laminations, and it's not typically, almost never, is it a delamination. It's a, it's a check, so then the question is, is that check of a size that uh, is acceptable? All right, some typical uses. So this happens to be a side-loaded stock glue lamb beam. It's uh, typically a framing uh, grade framing classification that's intended to, to be concealed. So maybe aesthetics aren't that big of a deal. We're not, not nearly as worried about aesthetics, so uh, 
We can use a lower grade, meaning the less time that the manufacturer works on that beam to give you a presentation that you're looking for, uh, the, the, the more that they can make a competitive uh, product for the end use. It happens to be a side-loaded beam here, so um, a designer would be concerned or want to make sure that they look at the torsional loads or stresses that are imposed on this beam because it's side-loaded. Beauty about glue lamb again is that it's a great product to resist those torsional stresses through the uh, it's done through the internal bonding of the lamination. And there are other beam products out there that it's a little more difficult for them to design around or meet the uh, the uh, considerations of that torsional load. Here we've got some residential uh, floor beams. Some of them may be dropped, like in this. This use right here, this is a dropped beam. It's underneath the framing members. We've got a concealed beam up here. It's, it's uh, buried within the members. Um, so whether dropped or concealed we would maybe dictate whether or not we're going to use a higher quality, meaning a higher appearance classification anyway. Strength may not change a bit, but the appearance might change because we want that desired appearance. And this application here on the lower right could very well be, since we've got this, this uh, beautiful wood beam sticking out underneath uh, the, framing mem the floor framing members, we might want to keep it there and have a nice warm feel of that wood. And uh, so we'd spend a little bit more time sanding and filling and giving you what would be called an architectural classification to that beam. Whereas the others, maybe not so much. We might use a framing grade, might look a little bit uglier, but that's all right because the intended use is to conceal it or to hide that in the end use. Here's another exposed product. This happens to be on a ridge beam. You see the framing on the right when it's open, and then we've got the finished product here on the left. Again, this is a great looking product. Um, one thing I'll make note of is See this fan, I'll just tell you to remember that fan. If I'm uh, able to get through this presentation and remember to talk about that later, we will for structural reasons. Here we've got garage headers. We've got the very obvious front garage header here, and then in the back midpoint of the garage, we've got an, uh, another beam uh, used at the mid span. Again, we might use this uh, mid-span one exposed in a garage. Maybe we don't care so much about the appearance anyway. Maybe we do. Maybe we want to have a nice finished painted garage. Um, so we would maybe con be concerned about the appearance. So the classification of appearance might change. Up front here, that will probably be uh, drywalled on the inside, and the outside obviously will be finished cladding. So we maybe don't care so much again about the appearance of that. That same beam here, as you can see, the uh, header was extended the garage door opening here. Typically, right here at this garage door junction is where we'd have uh, however many jack studs were required in a king stud to, to hold that beam in place. So in this case, we, be able, we are able to satisfy both the gravity loads, typically what we see for that beam, and to assist in uh, um, handling the lateral loads of that wall also. This is a use of wood columns. Uh, again, you can see on the left side, maybe this is all going to be concealed. Don't care quite as much about appearance. On the right side, well, the, although these beams have uh, seen a little bit of weathering, you can see that they've spent a little more time in the surface preparation of these two beams and columns on the right side here. So again, aesthetically, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're going to have an unfinished basement for a while, or even when you decide to finish your basement. could very well be that architecturally it would be desirable for you to want to keep um, that wood exposed. So as opposed to that beautiful red steel beam that you typically see in some of the basements, I'm sorry, column that you see in some of the basements, you may very well want to look at using a uh, wood glue lamp column. Tall walls, we talked a little bit about that before already. 
Uh, tall walls are becoming more and more used nowadays with the elaborate designs that we see by builders. Uh, the beautiful thing about glue lamb is that we can use glue lamb in the header application as we see here and we can use glue lamb as these tall posts columns. This uh, is going to have some very large windows as you can tell here so um, we're going to have large loading and we've got very little wood area to resist that. So to take care of the large wind load that's going to accumulate on there, glue lamb is a great long, straight, and strong product to use in that application. Again with tall walls, um, generally in a more traditional uh, structure you'd see somewhere between this red line uh, between floors, you'd see uh, another floor framing, either balloon framed or platform framing, uh, that would help resist the loads against that wall. In this case, the, they're using balloon framing, again, for the, the large openings for windows, excuse me. So um, that glue lamb is a nice, strong, stiff product to resist those loads. Okay, we talked a little bit about those appearance classifications already, so we're going to cover the four classifications uh, quickly. First one is that framing. So we talked about that already. If it's intended to be concealed application, uh, don't care so much about appearance uh, for the end use, whether exposed or not, usually concealed. But uh, if we don't care so much about the appearance, framing grade's a great product. Uh, the least amount of preparation work on the sides and ends, uh, faces of those beams. Uh, the beauty about framing classifications are that they meet that three and a half or five and a half nominal four and six inch walls that we see nowadays. So uh, works much better for the framer, a lot less work as far as uh, uh, trimming out or furring, whatever they might have to do. if. Uh, the beam or header, in this case, uh, doesn't match the framing width. So when we have to finish out the inside of the house, something needs to be done. The beauty of that framing grade is that it matches those widths, so less work to the uh, framer or the uh, finished installer of the drywall. Next up is an industrial grade. Again, it's still not quite as nice as an architectural grade, but it's a bit of a step up above from the uh, framing grade. It's typically used for concealed applications again and uh, not much uh, change as far as uh, the appearance though. It's, it's not uh, typically intended for permanent exposure for, for appearance sake. And then finally we have the architectural grade. That's the one that we typically see. If you are asking for an exposed aesthetic purpose of that beam, the architectural uh, appearance classification is typically the one that we ask for. There is another one called premium. The premium is a, it's a more of a custom product. You're going to need to ask for that. Yes, they spend more time on the uh, quality uh, requirements of what that beam is required and the surface preparation, but as we talked about on the checking and exposure to uh, moisture changes in the air, remember that uh, if you order a premium uh, and uh, you're going to expose that beam to elements that um, conditions that might cause movement due to moisture changes, you may very well have spent a lot more money uh, on a premium grade and end up with some surface checks that you maybe, uh, seasonal checks that you maybe didn't expect. So make sure you know what you want between the architectural and premium when you ask for that product. Could very well be that architectural is sufficient. Along with those uh, grade classifications, there's also textures that we can put on the face. This happens to be a rough sawn. So if you're looking for that industrial look of the old rough uh, industrial type timbers used in the olden days, this rough sawn appearance is a great option for that. But there's various uh, uh, other appearances that we can do or surface preparation that we can do 
on the face of the beams uh, to give you a, a texture or an appearance that you might be looking for. Okay, that architectural, here's a good shot of that. We've got exposed beams. If you look down here in the bottom part of the slide where I'm highlighting or circling with the dot, with the highlighter, uh, we've got some exposed wood cabinets there. We've got exposed connectors in the trusses. Everything really uh, complements each other in that exposed, warm look that we might be looking for with that architectural appearance. And here's one with the framing classification. If you look closely in certain areas, maybe like right in here, you can see some heavier glue lines right up here. You can just barely see it, but you've got a little bit of glue spill there. So again, this is concealed. It's uh, uh, not used to be an appearance uh, finished uh, appearance finished beam. So we don't care so much about maybe the appearance that we see now although it still looks pretty well, a uh, pretty decent looking beam. Um, at the end of the day, that framing classification is either used for concealed or we're, we were much more concerned with having that three and a half or five and a half width to be able to meet uh, the uh, framing widths of the nominal four and, five, four and six inch walls. So that's the first bullet here. What we're, when we're looking for certain widths to match up so we don't have to fur out less labor, things like that. All right, what about durability? So if we're going to expose beams or we think they're going to be exposed, we've got a technical guide here. Um, technical note, preservative treatment of glue laminated timber, that's form S580. If uh, you want to follow up on some more specifics about what we're discussing today, you might want to write this number down, S580, and pull that PDF down from our website. So preservative treated, if we're in a condition where we the wood is uh, going to be used in uh, wetter conditions, in, in the wood industry, 19% is kind of the line that we draw, but if you're getting anywhere close to that and the wood's expected to be out in those kinds of conditions. We really want to look at doing preservative treatments to the beams and um, uh, make sure that we don't have a risk of decay over time. So what is preservative treatment? Um, if you don't know, we do the same with lumber. This happens to be glue lamb. In the left here you see the pressure tank. We just take the raw untreated beam and uh, put as much as we can in that tank. Obviously, we're limited a little bit on tank size and we're talking about glue lamb, depending on the size that the glue lamb might be. But essentially, we just fill it up. On the right side here, you, you see we close the door. We introduce the uh, preservative material, whatever that is, and uh, induce it with a, a vacuum and draw that material through the wood for a period of time. And then that gives us that protective barrier around the surface of the uh, uh, beam. So when do we need the treated material or treated beams or columns? Well, building code says if we have direct exposure to what to uh, weather. Um, anytime, like I said, if you have a long-term exposure to weather and we know that we're going to be getting uh, extreme conditions on that beam, you're going to want to treat it. Ground contact. Anytime we have ground contact. We need to treat the beam because we'll have direct exposure to moisture and wicking and we definitely have issues with uh, moisture absorption into the wood. Fresh water or salt water, same reason. Contact with concrete, including foundations and footing. So um, we'll get into a connection detail on that later, but anytime that we're going to be in proximity to concrete, concrete's always uh, embedded into ground, so there's a... a a path for the water to always travel and we want to make sure that we consider that uh, when we're using uh, a glue lamp product, no, no different than any other wood product, to make sure that we have it preservative treated or some other details to prevent moisture from getting into the beam. Uh, anytime we're in a zone where we have termite concern, we, we'd have to protect the product again. Any wood product that's in that uh, zone, we need to protect it or some other means if it's not the preservative treatment that would uh, protect it. 
Indoor applications, when we're talking about humidity again, or high moisture applications like swimming pools and uh, greenhouses. Once again, there's a lot of risk for long-term exposure to moisture and decay, just as you have a, a potential risk for all of the connectors in those applications to rust. So we have to consider both the beam and all of the metal connectors that might be used inside uh, to make sure that we have proper proper material for the exposed exposure condition. So if we do treat the beam, if we cut it uh, on the job site, we want to make sure that we maintain that preservative or protective envelope. You can see here on this cut, uh, you've got probably a good quarter inch or so of good penetration of the um, preservative material around the entire uh, all surfaces of this beam, but once we cut it, we expose it. So we want to do what we can do as much as possible to re-soak uh, with whether it's a brush or dipping it again or spraying it. Somehow try to soak that wood again and get as much penetration as we can into the into the wood fiber. So other than treatments, what about finishes? What if we want to uh, give some sort of an architectural appearance? which would be applying some sort of a finish to the uh, exposed beam. This is a uh, table, if you will, from one of our publications on finishing and sealing or treating, I'm sorry, finishing and sealing uh, untreated beams. So on the left here, we would have some conditions that we would look at. Are we protected with low moisture fluctuation? Uh, do we have potential of significant high humidity swings? Do we have natural uh, wood look that we want to retain uh, on the finished product? Uh, is there any potential of extractives of the wood material? So there's different conditions that we might be concerned about or need to design around. And then depending on which one of those questions or conditions we need to address, you can see up top here we've got uh, all the different finishing type materials, water repellents or oil based or latex, things like that, um, and check marks of yes or X's of no as uh, to whether that's a preferred application or, or a uh, uh, recommended use in that application. And then if we want to paint one of the treated products, we need to uh, know which one it is. Typically, it's either a copper naphthenate or a copper eight, or uh, sometimes now we're also seeing a permethrin. And so, again, in the table, we need to know, is that paintable? What's the appearance that we were concerned with? And what are maybe some of the uh, further considerations that we have when we want to paint or finish over top of preservative beams? What if we don't want to treat it? Is there anything we can do there? Well, there are natural uh, resistant or naturally durable species out there. One is called Alaska yellow cedar. The other one is Port Orford cedar. And these are uh, both uh, naturally durable species to decay. So uh, it's a great product to maybe consider if you're not wanting to treat or not wanting to do much of a uh, finish on top of the treatment and you're looking for that natural uh, raw appearance of the wood, this might be the way you want to go. One consideration is that, that this is a slightly uh, weaker uh, wood than what typically we use for uh, 24F beams that we're used to seeing as the stock beams or the, the standard go-to beam in the industry. Not a big deal. We just need to know that our uh, design values are a little bit lower and we design around that. Just uh, not, not really a concern, just make sure it's a consideration in the design. So stock beams, what really are stock beams? The industry's uh, it, over the past many, many, many years has been known for its ability to make really nice looking beams, large beams, architectural, lots of curves or radius or uh, different shapes that we might want, like in the old churches or cathedrals or things like that. So we used to know beams as this custom, great big, beautiful glue lamp. Well, the industry, as I said early on in the presentation, has really evolved into supplying um, 
stock products now that can compete with all of the other engineered wood products out there. So a stock beam simply means that it's a design beam and a uh, typical beam that is stocked either at the dealer or the distribution facility and they're readily available the day of or following day of order. And they're still in uh, fairly long lengths, 48 to even up to 66 feet. Um, there are some appearance classifications that uh, we typically deal with. As I said, it's either architectural or framing classification, usually for the stock, stock beams. Another thing that comes up has to do with the uh, vast array of beams. That's, a, that, that's been brought up in the past where um, people have asked, do we, are there uh, too many options in glue lamb? And over the years, the uh, industry has really done a lot of testing and development to pare down to products that are typically needed for uh, residential construction, light frame commercial in the stock area where uh, loadings are fairly consistent and you end up finding out that uh, we either need this 24F or if we need the high strength we can jump up to a 30F 2.1E uh, uh, beam for those high strength. So the glue industry has uh, really paid attention to uh, evolving with the designs and competitive products to make sure they provide the right product that's in stock and, and uh, readily available. So the reality is, is all of the engineered wood products, as you see here, uh, there's a, there is um, a lot of design availability to the engineered wood products industry. At the end of the day, though, what gets specified and what's really carried and needs to be uh, stocked for the specifications we're seeing today. Really, there are two, two, um, two uh, areas that we typically see specified, and that's in that range of the 2400, or if we're really trying to meet the uh, higher strength needs for longer spans, things like that, we can get into the uh, 3000 F beam. But both the uh, glue lamb and the rest of the engineered wood industry, they both have uh, uh, products available in those classifications. So apparent E and shear free E, that's another topic that comes up uh, once in a while in, in the industry. As the uh, engineered wood products industry has evolved, um, basically the LVL product has used a different calculation uh, method, if you will, to um, publicize their E values than what the glue lamb industry has. At the end of the day, the, the real takeaway of this is there's no, there's no real difference between the two products in what you would uh, need in design and order. It's simply a, a two different methods that the industry has used in um, reaching their, the formula and reaching their E values. And, uh, Currently, there's two different ways of doing that. Hopefully, someday, maybe the industry will come together and reach consensus on how they calculate it. But at this point in time, there's just two different methods. But uh, as I said, at the end of the day, it really means nothing to the end use, design, and specification of the material. Okay, sizing. So lengths used basically um, when we're talking about lengths of glue lamb, it, it's really dependent on transportation many times. When we talk about stock beams, the lengths are uh, limited, as I said before, maybe up into the 60-foot range uh, around there. But um, you can get a glue lamb beam in just about any size you want that's usually limited by uh, transportation. They're always uh, uh, available in the eye joist depths, 9 and a half, 11 and 7 eighths, and even up in the 14, 16 inch range. Um, and then again, they have the uh, nominal 2 by 4 and 2 by 6 sizes available. Beam orientation, we get this question once in a while, but I think most people understand that um, a glue lamb beam is intended to be loaded parallel to the y axis as you see here. 
and there are values in the parallel x axis and you can design around that just as you would need to for like a column or something like that where you're loaded in all axes but in this condition when we're talking about beam orientation this is the uh, loaded direction that beams are, are designed for Cambers, another question that comes up once in a while in the old days, glue lamp beams, because again, they were able to be made just about in any size and configuration that realistically you would need for a building type. Uh, camber was a value to and still is a value to the glue lamp industry in providing camber when needed. Um, if you don't need the camber, then those stock beams, as I mentioned early on, we call those a zero camber or uh, no camber beams, and that's the way they're sold because they're essentially flat um, up to maybe a 3 sixteenths or a quarter inch to a foot. So essentially, looking at any other dimension lumber or other products out there, uh, it would be really difficult to find something 20 feet that was within only this much of a change or a variation in, in uh, the plane of that straightness of the beam. So the takeaway for this is there's plenty of uh, stock glue lamb out there that are sold with zero camber or no camber. So when we're ordering, what's most important when we order? Um, we'll take a quick look at, at the um, trademark. So as we mentioned earlier, the structural use of the beam is identified in the trademark up here, number one, B, so we know that's a beam. If it was, uh, this happens to be unbalanced, if it was a balanced beam and uh, it was continuous, um, you would see CB in that, in, in that uh, location instead of just B. Um, Next is the standard. We mentioned this early on. Anytime that you buy a glue lamp product, you need to make sure that this standard is referenced. All of uh, the APA members reference this standard and design to these standards, and it covers all the combination uh, layups, things like that, gluing that we talked about earlier on. And the structural grade designation in the middle there. In this case, this is a 24F and visually graded uh, beam. So there's B3s, B4s, there's uh, various uh, visual classifications within the grade. And so those designations would be noted in that center stamp along with the strength. And then appearance classifications. We just covered those, but you'll see up here in number seven, the, this happens to be an industrial appearance classification or it would be framing or architectural, whichever one it would be. So what about columns? Columns look really similar to the beams, the stamps anyway. So again, we have C in this case because it's in compression as a column and so that's what we're designing to. We have a combination. So within that, within this standard, that combination is identified and uh, we know what the uh, strength um, properties are for that combination that we designed to because again as we mentioned early on this is designed and loaded in all axes because it's a column and so there's a slight different notation on the strength for that. So what about um, how to use the beam, size of the beam, things like that. when? When is a glue lamb going to be used? In this case, we're going to show you a little bit about comparison, comparing or the comparison of a glue lamb to steel because uh, steel happens to be a, a big competitor to the wood. And so in this case, this is a drop beam that you see here. Uh, so it may be exposed permanently. Maybe we want to look at the uh, architectural classification if that's the case. So when we're talking about steel versus wood, it's a great application for glue lamp. Um, if uh, clearance becomes an issue, the reason this is dropped, you can see up here, is we needed to run mechanical through the top between the joists above the beam. If we had the beam con uh, dropped in, or concealed beam, we'd be, have a hard time uh, running the mechanical through, so we drop it down. Head heights might become a concern. If that is the case, then 
you know, we could either build the heights, the walls slightly higher or maybe go to a higher strength. But uh, when they typically use a steel beam, this is what we see. We'll see uh, some sort of furring or framing members because we know we still need to nail drywall or cabinetry or other things that might need to be hung off of or around that beam area. So by the time you put a nailer on the bottom and a nailer up here on the top, and then we put some filler nails, nailers in here for um, four foot or two foot on center for the, uh, the drywall, or in this case over here, we had to soften around the beam for some finished application. The time you do all this stuff, and you look at the differences in, in uh, time, both in money and time, and in installing the products, it uh, might be time to look at blue lamb and see if maybe it could displace the steel in this instance when we're talking, again, about the whole cost of installing rather than just looking at the cost of product wood to steel uh, foot by foot. So other things to maybe consider when we're talking about specifying, we want to make sure that we understand and know what that appearance classification is. We want to make sure that it's protected and wrapped in a way that's conducive to the end user when they uh, install the product. If the wrapping needs to stay on, we individually wrap, things like that. Do we need some protective sealers or finishes? Do we need preservative treatments or both? Uh, if we don't want that stock zero camber beam and we're actually in an application where we need to design in a little bit of camber, we need to know that so that gets specified. And then if we're in a uh, fire rated assembly application, um, Blue Lamb works great for that too, that uh, uh, you can simply do some small things in the design and then in the layup of the beam after the design to to increase the amount of wood fiber around the outer perimeter of the beam to handle the burn or char rate of wood, and you're good to go with the glue lamp to meet uh, a one-hour fire assembly. So that works well, too. Connections. Um, again, this is that shot of, of uh, the exposed connections. But as I mentioned earlier, we'd get into this. Uh, if we're going to be in proximity to like a concrete foundation, in this case, we want to make sure that we pay attention here where this connection is at, that we leave room for air, in this case a half inch air gap, and if it's uh, bearing on uh, an area near the concrete, we'd want to have some sort of a non-porous moisture break there to, to uh, prevent any wicking up through there through the uh, bottom of the beam. So if you're still convinced you need to use a steel column to uh, support that beam in, in certain applications, make sure that we pay attention to the size of that seat, have the right size bearing area that we need, and then uh, design in the size of the lag screws, in this case a half inch lag screw, but all things that we need to consider in the design. If not, and we move to Something like a glue lamp column also. There's easy connections with either side plates or maybe even a saddle uh, type connection. Further at the ends, if uh, we aren't uh, bearing in like that concrete that we saw earlier, um, the only a couple things that we want to make sure we're, we're considering is that we have the right amount of jacks or trimmers underneath the beam to handle whatever bearing conditions that we have. And then we have that king stud on the end that comes up to the top of the bottom plate. I'm sorry, the bottom of the top plate and uh, uh, takes care of the rotation by nailing 16 penny nails into the side or into the beam through the side of that king stud. And here's a shot of that saddle that I was talking about earlier. So it could be in the center somewhere, but on the end, if we don't have a condition where we can apply or for whatever reason don't use that king stud, then there are staff saddle plates that work fine for that too. Face mounting eye joists, we touched on it a little bit, but there are a couple things that we want to make sure that, that we uh, pay attention to on face mounting. Um, or side mounting the uh, the joist. Uh, if we have a face mounted hanger like we see on the left here, 
the one thing we really want to make sure we're paying attention to is not to save that extra three or five cents a hanger and cut the hanger off, stay down in this location where we now don't have that top flange supported. If we did have that condition, then up down here in these two areas, we'd have to have filler pieces put in on each side of the web to uh, handle the rotation. And, or we could uh, just use a top-mounted hanger that works well for that also. What about ridge beams? We have a cathedral exposed uh, ceiling. And that nice, uh, beautiful glue lamb that we talked about earlier supporting the roof from below. Um, we want to make sure that we have a beveled cut. You can see here a beveled cut uh, nailer that we put on top of the beam. And then we can apply uh, our, our uplift hangers or whatever might else be needed in this condition. We may need tie straps on the top. We might need blocking between, uh, between the uh, tr uh, rafters. So all those then can be applied afterwards. And then, uh, again, make sure that if there is uplift that we're paying attention to the uplift and what size those um, hangers are or connectors are. Flashing. So if we're exposed to the outside uh, in condition, that same beam we just showed on that cathedral ceiling, let's say that they've got some sort of an overhang outside to do some passive solar type design in the architecture. We want to make sure that we pay attention to that beam that continued outside, that we cover that with some flashing on the top to prevent moisture um, loaded into the beam from the top and then running down the sides. That again can cause uh, premature weathering and decay and uh, excessive checking. Lots of things can happen there where we have that exposure of uh, wet and dry, hot and cold, wet and dry to where, uh, where we're uh, stressing the wood fibers of the beam more. And so that's the top one, top mounted flashing. And then the, the uh, detail to the right here is an end cap. So for the same reasons, uh, to protect the end as much as we can too, to make sure that we uh, prevent any premature weathering. And you notice in both conditions, we have this um, minimum half inch air gap. So we have some little wood nailers or some other type of a uh, spacing mechanism up there to make sure we allow for an air gap and air movement. Drilling and notching, uh, in this condition, uh, we want to make sure that we're notching uh, on the right, correct side of the beam if we are doing any notching. Typically, we prefer not to do any field notching and if we do, though, you can go to our technical note again, field notching and drilling of glue lamb beams. You see here form S560. In this case, we've got a field notch here in the bottom side of the beam, which is going to cause a stress. And uh, we, wouldn't, we would have wanted to have done something different on the bearing area rather than notch the beam. But let's assume they did notch it and installed it. There are some fixes for that. In, in this case, there are some limitations on the size that that notch can be. And then uh, we would design in, the engineer would design in the size of lag screw that we would need to take care of, of that intrusion that we put on the beam. Uh, big thing here is that neutral axis. We want to make sure whatever we design in, we get plenty of uh, bite into the wood fiber on the upper side of that neutral axis to uh, prevent more of that pulling on the tension side. Notching on top. So if we do need to do notching, we prefer the top. And I'll show you this uh, uh, preferred side uh, detail in a second. But um, if, there is, if there is a need for notching to run material through, maybe conduit or something like that, a little bit of plumbing, we prefer to do it on the top compression side. And as we so showed earlier on, where the, the heavier stresses are at, uh, this is the better location, if we can, to reduce the amount of stress or reduction in stress by being on the top compression side and out on the bearing location as far as possible. Remember, this is compression, so it's a simply loaded beam also. Tapered cuts. 
If we don't uh, taper past the edge of that bearing location, we're typically okay. Not much to worry about there. The minute we taper out into the beam, we're losing size here, both for shear and for uh, uh, design. So we want to make sure we're checking bending and checking shear again the minute we have this type of taper. Even though we have some prescriptive limitations on, on uh, size, we still to make, need to make sure the engineer goes back and looks at the calculation. We talked about this early on. I told you I'd show you that uh, fan that was hanging off the beam early on in that uh, exposed ceiling. We'd get to that again. So again, we don't really prefer, don't like uh, drilling vertically through the beam. In this case, they may have needed to drill a hole to run the uh, conduit and or wiring through for that fan that we showed you earlier. There are some significant reductions when they do that. So we need to know when they're doing it and we need to design around that if in fact somebody's going to do it. And that's It's a loss of one and a half times the hole diameter. So in this case, if you did the calculation on this six and three quarter inch beam, we did a one inch diameter hole drilled through there vertically. That's a reduction of one and a half times one and then divided by the width of the beam, six and three quarters. Well, we reduced it nearly a quarter, 22%. So we've only got 78% left on that beam. So as I said earlier, we need to, if we're going to do it, we need to make sure we know it's done beforehand so we can calculate those reductions prior to installation rather than after and maybe have a uh-oh. Told you uh, earlier, this is a, a good depiction of where the uh, critical areas are or are not and where we most prefer to be able to do the horizontal holes or drill those horizontal holes. This is that location that I showed you earlier. So we're out on the end of the beam. We're on the compression side. We're on the bearing area. So much better place um, uh, to put the hole. And then in the center area here, where we're not as much in the shear critical and we're not in the uh, compression or uh, tension loaded side uh, where the uh, critical laminations are. So again, there are areas that we can, we can uh, make penetrations, but we want to make sure that we're designing for those. Okay, so we've touched again on uh, these areas that I said we would at the beginning of the presentation for our learning objectives, characteristics, unbalanced versus balanced, appearance, selecting the material, understanding and reading the grade stamp, checking, uh, connections, notching, talked about those, treated, uh, and then whether it's factory or field applied finishes or stains, we talked about that too. All right, so going from the uh, learning objectives, I want to again just touch a little bit about on, on APA and where to get further resources for glue lamb specifically in this application and this presentation. You go to apawood.org forward slash glue lamb. Um, we've got a lot of resources there. We have member contacts, so all the producers are, producers are listed there. If you have a custom application or a specific question that you want answered, that's where we want to go and uh, make contact with a specific uh, manufacturer. Or if it's something that's more uh, generic or about what we talked about today or um, just field issues, things like that where um, you have a question for APA, uh, further clarification uh, about any of our guides that we talked about today, this is our help desk, desk number, 253-620-7400. We've got folks over there that just have an enormous library of information. They've collected years and years of questions, so uh, it's kind of hard to stump them anymore, but feel free to try to give them a call and stump them all you want. Um, they're a great resource, so feel free to call them for any help that you need. If you need assistance in the field, uh, there are folks like myself located around most of the major cities in the country or close by and we cover those cities so you can also again from our website locate where any one of our field staff personnel are located and they can meet you either at your office or on the job site to further discuss 
any design or application issues, things that might come up or questions you might have. Um, on our website, too, uh, when you get into that resources uh, side for publications, um, we want to uh, make sure that you, you uh, know there's availability for uh, updates. So we've got publication updates. Uh, when, you, when you sign into APA, this is not really easy to see, but up in this top right corner, it will either say sign in or it will have, uh, have you logged in already. And if you're already logged in, then you'll have a list of uh, areas that you can go. If you go to your profile, we ask you some questions, one of which is publication updates. Do you want publication updates? So we showed you a number of publications today. Any one of those could be revised for any reason, and you wouldn't know that they're revised. You might be outdated or have an outdated publication, rather. So make sure that you click on the selection box to say, give me updates. So APA, every two or three months, will send out publication updates and let you know things that have changed so that you know you're up to date all along. And then there's the designer circle. That's another selection. If you're not part of the designer circle, we, we give you a lot of new information about things that come up, new publications, new design, applications, case studies, things like that that would come up. Again, we'll send you uh, a link to that with the designer circle so that you can uh, maybe have some new innovative approaches or some things that you were wondering about might show up. And that, that usually comes through on the designer circle. So you want to check both of those. Um, selection boxes. And as I mentioned earlier, underneath the uh, Glue Lamb products location of the uh, website, you can look up the members directory, manufacturing directory of Glue Lamb, uh, uh, and then contact someone specifically in your area if you need to. Speaking of literature, this happens to be the Engineered Wood Construction Guide, we call that Form E30. It's kind of the APA's Bible. It has all of the information you would need for panels, engineered wood products, including I-Joist, LVL, Glue Lamp, any of those products, they're all listed here. Um, and we talk about the product selection, the specification, trademark, specific trademark, uh, applications, all the things you need for floor walls and roofs. And most of what you'll need is in this guide. It's a great guide to have. You should keep that handy. And further, we have a, you can either reach it through apawood.org or you can just uh, Google apacad.org. And we've got CAD details for pretty much anything we've just been talking about today also. OK. Hey, thanks, Roger. We did get some questions today. We'll be posting answers to those questions on our website with the recorded version of this webinar. So that ends the webinar today. We thank you for your attention, and uh, have a great day.